thanks very much to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be able to meet with you all these two days. Uh, this isn't a history talk. Let me just let me just warn you up front. You're going to see me in a different sort of mode from what most of you are used to. Um, but it, it's it's this paper I've got that it fits so neatly into the theme of the workshop that it just seemed uh, like I had to give it. Um, so um, let me just let me just plunge in. Um, I, I'm interested in the the subject, the broad subject of philosophical disasters. Um, think of, of political philosophical disasters like the Hobbesian state of nature, uh, ethical disasters like Parfit's repugnant conclusion, um, intellectual disasters like Plato's cave. Uh, and this is where my interest lies today in, in the subject of intellectual disasters. Um, now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by, well, first of all, I'll give you some more examples of what I mean by an intellectual disaster. And then I'll look at some reasons to think that these disasters aren't as bad as you might suppose. That's part one of the paper. Then part two of the paper, I'll argue that, in fact, they are nearly as bad as they seem. And I'm going to offer a kind of um, rough account of how to measure the, the nature of an intellectual disaster. And then finally, I'll look at a couple of objections to, to my way of thinking about all of this. So um, here's some background to, to what I'm trying to do. I'm, a way to sort of fixate on what I'm interested in is that I'm interested in the familiar skeptical scenarios. And narrowly, we think of these scenarios as doing just what the label implies, is describing a case we lack knowledge. Um, but, but I think, and some of you, if you've read my book After Certainty, you'll, you'll know why I say this, but I think epistemology spends too much time thinking about the English word knowledge. Um, and more generally, I think epistemology should spend more time thinking broadly about our grasp of reality. So to start very broadly, I want to think of the familiar skeptical scenarios as each describing a kind of intellectual disaster that might afflict human beings. So I already mentioned Plato's cave. There's evil demons. There's the matrix world where we're all inside a computer matrix, as in the movie. Um, there's, there's the dreaming doubt in a world in which you know, we're all um, in dreams or, um, or might be in dreams, or there's a very precarious risk that we might be mistakenly dreaming and not know it. Um, so think of those as all a kind of intellectual disaster. Now, they all seem pretty bad, um, but maybe the disasters aren't so bad. There's a line of thought, and here I am going to get into a bit of history of philosophy. There's a line of thought suggesting that, well, maybe, in fact, even if these things were to obtain, they wouldn't be as bad as they seem. So let me give you some examples of previous disasters. Since roughly 1543, we've known that our perspective on the motion of the heavens is a delusion. All right, this was a disaster. We were completely misunderstanding the nature of the solar system. Since roughly 1623, we've known that most of the sensible qualities of bodies are nothing like what they appear to be, um, right? Color out in the world, it's nothing like what it appears to be and so on and so forth for these familiar uh, sensible qualities. Uh, since 1911 or so, we've known that the shapes of bodies are themselves an illusion, inasmuch as the apparently solid world around us is mostly empty space, right? So the bodies you're surrounded by, they're, they're I mean, very, very little of those bodies is actually um, occupied um, by stuff. It's mostly just empty. So then you might think, okay, those are all examples of actual intellectual disasters that we've, that we've discovered. Um, and yet, it's kind of like we, we discover these things and we think, well, where's, where's the disaster here? Um, it seems like they, they show us all of these cases that the world is nothing like what it seems to be, even, its even in its most familiar aspects, and nothing like what we had taken it to be. Yet, remarkably, what, what seems to happen is that once, once we sort of figure out that there's no way around these lessons of modern science, we simply accept this radically new understanding of reality and we move on. Uh, and any sense of intellectual disaster we may have felt is quickly supplanted by the excitement of the new fields of inquiry these discoveries opened up. And so it looks like in these kinds of cases, the moral of the story is that even with regard to our most fundamental understanding of the world around us, we can get used to anything. 
You know, we can wake up in the morning and discover that reality is fundamentally unlike we thought it was. And we just, we shrug and we move on. Um, and it doesn't, there's no, there's, there's no sort of sense that there's some sort of disaster uh, that's occurred. Moreover, and, and here's where things get really interesting to my mind. It, it's as if, despite this radical sea change in the way we, we view the world, our beliefs, we don't even think of our former beliefs as even having been false. Um, so, um, we open up new frontiers for scientific research, but this doesn't lead us to revise our old ways of talking. We still speak of sunrises and sunsets. We still talk about the colors of the outside world. We still say that the bodies around us are solid uh, and that we continue quite happily to speak in all these ways without any apology, suggests that these ways of speaking are true, that the sun does rise and set, that objects are colored, that the bodies that seem solid, in fact, just are solid. Moreover, at least with respect to color and solidity, it's not as if these ways of talking are true in some sort of extended non-literal sense. Even though we've learned that the world is nothing like what we once supposed it to be with respect to its very most salient features, we nevertheless go on to hold that it truly and literally has these features. So where's the disaster? It's as if we were never wrong about these things, in the first place. So what seems to be happening here is that language has a puzzling sort of resilience uh, to, to, to radical changes even uh, in our worldview. Um, when, when the illusion's first discovered, there is a kind of initial impulse that we need to revise language. This is famously the case um, with, with respect to, to what we call the secondary qualities. So Galileo uh, writes, I think that if ears, tongues, and noses were removed, shapes and numbers and motions would remain, but not odors or tastes or sounds. The latter, I believe, outside the living animal, are nothing more than names. Or Descartes, colors, smells, tastes, and so on, are merely certain sensations existing in my thought and differ no less from bodies than pain differs from the shape and motion of the weapon inflicting the pain. Okay, so these are very famous um, claims that, that these guys make in the 17th century, but, but what, you know, and there's a lot of scholarship um, about this sort of thing, but, but ultimately, I mean, the bottom line here is that uh, eventually these suggestions are cast aside and language continues as it always has. We just go on talking as if the qualities are out in the world. It's true for all, you know, for, for all purposes that matter. It's just, a, it's just a feature of our language that it's true that these qualities are out in the world. Uh, and then here's kind of the punchline for my purposes. Once one sees how this pattern has played out in actual cases, it's natural to form the suspicion that it would continue to hold through even more dramatic future discoveries about the world. For instance, if we were to be convinced of Berkeley and idealism, right, and the material world were to turn out to be entirely an illusion, um, we'd, language would continue on. There wouldn't be uh, it, it, these sorts of examples suggest there wouldn't be any great disaster here. We, you know, we, we wouldn't be a sort of Plato's caves kind of skeptical scenario. We'd just continue as things always have been, um, which is indeed, recall what Barclay himself thinks, that we should just continue talking as we always have. Let me give you um, um, a, a, a made up, a non-historical, sort of radical, kind of skeptical possibility. Imagine that we sleep for long stretches of our lives and awake only occasionally to feed and procreate. So think of us not like bears, but like cicadas. We wake only once every 17 years or so for a brief period. Um, those brief waking experiences furnish our minds with sensory experiences that then fuel long bouts of dreaming, year long dreams. And imagine that these dreams are quite continuous and coherent, enough so as to create in each of us a comprehensive dream world, so rich and immersive as to leave us unaware that we're dreaming. Okay, so this is Descartes' dreaming doubt on steroids, right? This is a sort of a radicalized version of the dreaming doubt. Given In this scenario, I wanna suggest, given the proportion of our mental lives taken up by dreams, our private dream world would be the chief reality of our lives. And then it would be natural enough to conclude that what happens to me in my dreams is what happens to me in my life. 
And so if we then imagine some great philosopher, some Galileo of hibernation world um, emerging, and I don't mean emerging in someone's dream, but somehow she's in the world, she wakes herself up from the dreams, she attempts to teach the technique of waking ourselves to the true reality of things. Well, it would be the greatest scientific discovery in the history of hibernation world. It would be this radical breakthrough that would make you know, the Copernican revolution look like nothing. But we'd sooner or later fall back asleep, we'd dream on, these private dream worlds would remain our worlds. Uh, this, you know, this great scientist who discovered this, we might treat her like Socrates and put her to death, who knows what we'd do, but, but we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't, I think in this scenario, reject the reality of our dream worlds. We'd go on thinking of that as our reality, just as in the actual world, we don't reject the reality of a world of colors, sounds, and solid bodies. We just go on speaking of the world as if they have these features. They do have these features, despite the radical transformation we've, we've undergone in our, in our understanding of what these things are. So even in hibernation world, where's the intellectual disaster? What, what, what's the problem? In what sense is there something bad about a world like this from an intellectual point of view? So that's the, that's the first line of thought meant to kind of motivate the whole project of the paper, uh, because now what I want to do is to try to sort of tell a story about under the, the circumstances under which we do have true intellectual disasters, what, what that would be like, why, why these worlds are disasters, what makes for an intellectual disaster. Uh, first thing I want to do is I want to distinguish between individual knowledge and communal knowledge. Individual knowledge is what we usually study, right? I believe P, P is true, um, I am justified in believing P and so on. And so that's, that's a piece of knowledge I possess. It's a, it's a disposition within me. Um, so I want to shift away from that usual topic to thinking about communal knowledge, which I'll signal with a capital K to indicate that I'm talking about the communal. Now, in focusing on the communal, what I mean to be doing is shifting away from the question of whether each one of us individually knows a certain fact to whether anyone among us, whether there's someone among us, some you know, great scientific figure among us, say, who's discovered this fact and publicized it. Um, so it, this is in a way sort of an arbitrary way of, of defining communal knowledge, but it's just the, the, the sense of it that'll be most useful for my purposes as I want to tell the story. So as I want to tell the story, for it to count as communal knowledge, it's enough for the discovery to have been made by just one person, provided that the discovery has been made publicly available. And so then with that distinction in mind between what each of us as individuals knows with a small k and what, what a culture knows as a community with a capital K, with that distinction in mind, let me distinguish between illusions and delusions. Let an illusion be a case where an individual suffers from an, indi from an inability to perceive things as they are. Um, and that might be because of drugs or some sort of um, mental illness or just some sort of you know, breakdown in, in perceptual faculties. Um, in contrast, let a delusion be a communal failure of that sort. And so it's delusions that I'm really interested in in this paper. Um, it just occurred to me, I've got a copy of the slides I meant to share with you all. Let me, um, let me send you a link to that in case that's helpful. I was all set up to do this and then I just forgot. Okay, if you want your own copy of the slides, there they are. So the illusion case, not so much what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the delusion case where all of society is under um, this, sort of, um, this sort of delusion. And then, oh, okay. Um, the examples considered earlier are all examples of delusions of a certain sort. We were, we were deluded about the nature of the solar system before Copernicus. Um, I mean, in some sense, appearances still are delusory, but we, you know, we, we, learn, we, learn, about, we learn how to adjust for the delusion. 
Uh, what the historical examples considered earlier have in common is that despite the delusion, from a communal perspective, there's successes rather than disasters. So even though it took us a very long time to discover that the earth moves around the sun, and even though a great many people on the planet doubtless still fail to know this, nevertheless, it's something we succeeded in knowing with a capital K. We were deluded and now we're not. And you can go through these, these other sorts of historical examples I mentioned earlier and a similar sort of point obtains. So how do, we, how do we develop a kind of a taxonomy of the cases that are success stories and we shouldn't think of them as intellectual disasters versus the cases where there's, there's properly a kind of intellectual disaster or, or there would be one if the world were like that. I want, to use, I want to develop this notion of our being locked in in a certain sort of way. Intellectual disasters arise, I want to claim, when we're unable to bridge the gap between appearance and reality, putting the stress on that word unable. We're unable to bridge that gap. More precisely, uh, in the historical cases under discussion, as, as the last slide ex explained, the delusive character of our world initially stymied us but we ultimately arrived at a grasp of the underlying reality. In contrast, in disastrous worlds, there's some sort of principled obstacle to our making that leap. To say that the obstacle exists in principle is to say not only that most people will never know about the reality that lies behind appearances, but also that we as a civilization will never know about it. And so here's where the communal versus individual move comes into play first, because I want to say, look, what, what the, the real test is the test of, is it possible for, for someone to know about it in such a way that our culture with a capital has, has knowledge with a capital K? Um, um, if that's not possible, if not even the experts can come to have knowledge about this gap between appearance and reality, then in these worlds, I want to say that we're locked in, that we're incapable of transcending our delusions. And so that doesn't apply to any of the historical cases because the historical cases are all, are all success cases. So let me now distinguish between some various dimensions of disaster, um, ways in which the disaster can be more or less. The most extreme way to be locked into a world is to be wholly incapable of grasping the delusion. The civilization wouldn't have any ability to know even that it is deluded. Um, you know, as if, um, as if in dream world, say, um, that is hibernation world, um, it was just completely impossible for anybody to figure out um, that they were in fact spending most of their lives dreaming. Um, so that's, that first, that first um, case is the most extreme. Once there's some sort of minimal level of communal knowledge, then of course it can become more or less widespread. Um, for instance, the inhabitants of hibernation world may all come to know their delusion, but only once every 17 years and only for a brief period. Like they wake up, they realize where they are. They're like, oh, wow, right, this is the world I'm in. But then they go back to sleep and they just completely lose sight of that and they take their dreams for reality. Um, Next bullet point, another example, there could be a handful of wise folk living in a platonic cave who realize that their reality is a pale shadow of the real world, but they just might not be able to get through to the larger population that's entirely ignorant of this. And so this is all a matter of degree, right? More or less people might um, come to have knowledge of um, the delusion they're laboring under. Um, Third, a civilization might know the bare fact that its world is delusive, but be unable in principle to make significant progress in understanding the nature of what lies behind appearances. Um, here, let me mention the matrix world. Um, this, you could imagine this being the situation in a matrix world, um, you know, like in the movie. Um, I mean, most likely is the, is the first scenario where, where people in that world are wholly incapable of grasping the delusion. They've got no idea they're living in a matrix. Um, or then you could imagine, you know, more fancifully that some people figure it out that, wow, their whole world is a computer simulation. But, um, 
even and then that might become more or less widespreadly known that that people that, that their world is a simulation that would be the second sort of dimension but then this third dimension would be the dimension in which even if everybody came to know that they were living in a computer simulation they had absolutely no capacity to grasp the nature of what lies behind appearances you know, it would be it would be like returning to a more mundane example. It would be like if we came to understand that colors in the world are not as they seem to be, but we had no capacity uh, to understand what produces color. Um, we we had the, we grasped the bare fact of the delusion, but couldn't go any further. And it's easy to imagine that being the situation in, in a matrix world, unless you you know there's something like a red pill that you can take that then that then reveals the reality that lies behind the matrix. All right. Um, still more by way of dimensions of um, of disaster. I want to distinguish between intensive and extensive delusion. So let's think of our epistemic home the place where, thanks to the resilience of language, we're in a strong position to have knowledge as the known world. These are the things we know about, even if there's some kind of gap between appearance and reality, still we, we can grasp that and we can, um, um, we can use language to refer to how things are. Um, so everything's good there. Um, but in cases where experience tends to con conceal the constitutive structure of underlying reality, we can think of ourselves as being intensively deluded. All right, what I mean by that is, I'm, is I just mean the kinds of cases I've been talking about a lot already, like cases of secondary qualities where um, it's hard to grasp the underlying reality behind the secondary qualities. And again, if we imagine a case where we're just not capable of grasping what lies underneath the, the, the secondary qualities, we would be intensively deluded. Um, another case of that, sort of shifting the secondary quality story a little bit, um, would be phenomenal consciousness. We can grasp what it feels like to be phenomenally conscious, but we're still not in very good shape in terms of, un of understanding the constitutive underlying reality behind um, phenomenal consciousness. Do we have immaterial minds? Um, is it all physical? Is it computational like? Obviously, these are still live issues. We don't know. So at the moment, there's a kind of intensive delusion we're laboring under, where all we've got is the phenomenal experience of consciousness. And we really can't say what the constitutive underlying reality is. To be locked in, in that sense, to go back to that earlier expression, would be for it to turn out um, right that, that it's just hopeless, that we'll never grasp the underlying reality behind consciousness. That would be to be uh, intensively deluded in a way that we just can't um, fix. That's to be contrasted then with a second kind of gap that arises when the known world fails to give us access to some distinct portion of reality. To be locked in in this way is to be extensively deluded. Um, let me, and, and so the bullet points here give some examples of this sort of thing um, and how science has been progressively filling in our extensive delusions. So um, when Hieronymus Fracastorius, not a household name, I realize, but he's the guy who first postulated germs as the vehicle for disease transmission back in the 16th century. Um, when he did that, he filled in a critical gap in our knowledge with a capital K, right? There was a whole portion of reality, um, the, you know, the, the microscopic living thing portion of reality that we knew nothing of. Um, and Fracastorius is the first person to sort of get us thinking about this, this picture of reality filled in a kind of extensive gap in our knowledge. Around the same time, European explorers were doing the same thing with geography um, and their discoveries of new continents, right? Filling in a picture that had been gappy in terms of our extensive grasp of what there is um, in the world. And obviously now astronomy is the new frontier of this and we keep expanding our grasp of what there is in the galaxy and in the universe and in possibly pluriverses and you know, it goes on and on. These are all examples of extensive delusions, right? Not what's, not, not what's the, the structure underlying the reality we experience, but what's simply beyond that whether it's too small or too distant or too temporarily distant, these are all forms of extensive delusion. Uh, 
So last bullet point, um, inevitably in our world, we suffer from massive amounts of this because we just, the world's too big, it's too old. Think of the future. The future is another place in which we're um, extensively just incapable of grasping what lies in the future. What we hope though, and here's another dimension of, um, of a potential disaster. What we hope is that this distant reality is homogeneous with the reality we are familiar with, right? So we know about our solar system. We hope that other solar systems are similar in, in, in sufficient ways. We hope that other galaxies are similar. We hope you know, more broadly that the laws of nature um, are the same. Um, we run into the risk of true intellectual disaster if we worry that there's going to be some kind of radical discontinuity between our local world and the broader reality. Um, and in a way, Plato's cave is the, um, you know, the, the perfect exemplar of that sort of worry, where we mistakenly think that the familiar world around us is the way the whole world is. Um, and cave. Um, and matrix world, hibernation world, same pattern in all of these cases. What's, what's especially bad about these worlds is not just that there's things that people in these worlds don't know, but that, that there's another reality that's radically heterogeneous relative to the known world. So that's the sort of sketch of an account of how we might think about what it is for worlds to be intellectually disastrous, the kind of worlds that from an intellectual point of view, we would hope that we don't live in. Let me um, move now to the final section of the paper and consider a couple of objections to all of this. Um, first of all, what, do we, what, what should we think about theological worldviews? Um, and this is an objection because if you think about it, and for many of you, it's, you know, it's our business to think about these kind of worlds. Um, they might seem to be precisely the sort of bad intellectual disaster that I'm describing. Um, so and I, so the, the bullet points here tell the story about why this might seem like precisely what I've characterized as an intellectual disaster and a really bad one, if indeed we lived in the sort of theological world that you know, our medieval heroes uh, characterized. Uh, so first, if we possess an immaterial soul, we'd be intensively deluded about our own natures. After all, philosophers have been able to establish essentially nothing about what these souls are. Uh, apologies to those of you who work on the medieval soul and will take umbrage at that, but, but I'm, I'm sorry, you know, the theories have a lot to say, but they don't really tell us anything about the nature um, of these souls in any deep sort of way. So if we do have an immaterial soul, there, there's a sense in which, for now at least, we're locked in. We, 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 we cannot grasp the nature of, of what such a soul is. And we're talking about our very own natures in saying that. Next bullet point. What about the larger spiritual domain of God and angels? Well, first of all, in this kind of world, we'd be extensively deluded about a vast portion of reality. And for the medieval mind, you, you know, the, the, the domain of God and angels is in some sense most of what there is in the universe. At any rate, it's a vast part of reality. And although, you know, within a given faith tradition, there's certain stories that are accepted about the nature of this reality, um, we don't really know, you know, that much about it, even on the most optimistic sort of story, it's, it's highly speculative. Um, the nature of, of the angels and what sorts of higher beings might be out there. And, and of course, our knowledge of God um, and what that's like is, is highly limited. Um, next bullet point, we'd also most likely be intensively deluded even about the material world, right? What, what, is, what, is, what is constituted by the familiar world around us? Inasmuch as standard theologies take God to play an ongoing constitutive role in the causal makeup of ordinary bodies. Right, I'm thinking God's role in not just creating but conserving the material world, God's role as the primary cause in all causal relationships, leaving us as just secondary causes at best. Uh, and philosophers 
in a theological mood speculate about these things, but we don't have any good deep understanding of this. Uh, final bullet point, and this is in a way worse, the, the worst feature of all, the reality we're locked out of exhibits precisely the sort of radical heterogeneity that's characteristic of intellectually disastrous worlds. Because the theological worldview isn't just saying, oh, there's more stuff out there beyond our world, stuff that's just like our world. No, it's saying the reality that's out there that we only dimly see as if in a mirror, that dim reality, that dimly grasped reality is radically different from the world we're familiar with. So it looks so far just like the intellectual disaster I'm describing. I think everything I've just said is right. It is an intellectual disaster or it would be an intellectual disaster, but it's another part of the theological program to try to tell a story to make that seem not so bad. So um, reading the slide, Although part of the business of theology is to accentuate the radical otherness of the spiritual realm, these worldviews at the same time take great care to avoid the implication that we are intellectually locked in to the material realm. Um, that's also part of their business, to avoid this impression that we're locked in. So first of all, theology almost always identifies a path to spiritual knowledge with regard both to the divine and to the spiritual nature that lies within us. In fact, it might plausibly be said that the central concern of religion is to teach us how to advance along that path, either through rational or effective practices. Uh, and much of religious practice, of course, revolves around efforts to reach that aim in this life and thereby prove oneself worthy of receiving the fuller understanding in the next life. And I think that religions are so uniformly preoccupied with this issue suggests just how seriously we take the threat of radical delusion. It would be, in other words, it would be, it would be very bad to set up this theology and then leave it at that and then just say, ah, it's hopeless. We'll never understand this larger world, not in this life, not in the life to come. There's no prospect of that. Um, there may be theologies out there, and perhaps some of you will have examples for me. Perhaps even within Christianity, there are examples of people who take that sort of view. But, I, but, but of course, in the Christian sphere, and I think in Islam and in any other religions I'm familiar with, um, the line instead is that, yes, there's this other domain, radically different from our domain, but good news, there's a path for you to achieve enlightenment, to achieve illumination of this other realm. And, and, and the religion is largely, I think it's fair to say that the religion is largely kind of oriented around how individuals can, can, can find a path that will bring them to that sort of enlightenment. So theology would be an intellectual disaster, but theology contains within itself uh, the resources for curing uh, the potential disaster. Uh, second objection, why should we privilege the communal in the way I have? I've argued that what matters to the question of intellectual disasters, not so much what ordinary folk know, but what the community knows. Um, I mean, let me, let me say a bit more about that uh, to, to make it clear. I'm, I mean, basically, in judging whether a certain sort of world is a disaster, I've put a lot of weight on whether anyone is able to discover the delusion and, and reveal it and, and get behind it and see the underlying reality. And so I say the case of Copernicus is a great success and the case of secondary qualities is a great success and the, the atomic structure of matter is a great success. All of these are happy cases, I say. And I'm not really so concerned over whether you know, most people in our culture understand these things. Um, to me, that doesn't matter so much um, on the story I'm telling. Um, what matters is whether you know, the few who are in the business of knowing can figure it out. Uh, and that naturally raises the question, why, why think of it that way? Why prioritize the knowledge of a few elites? Um, 
And, and here, you know, you might think not just of famous discoveries of the sort I've been describing, you know, the sort that any of us are familiar with, but think of all of the obscure intellectual discoveries of modern science, um, you know, that none of us know about, that, that almost none of which will ever be known by more than a handful of specialists. By my lights, these are all huge intellectual successes that, that, that sort of warrant a judgment that the world we live in is not at all an intellectually disastrous world. But, but one might wonder, why should we care about living in a world where this sort of esoteric, very limited knowledge is possible? Uh, in, in short, what's, what's so good about knowledge with a capital K? Um, let me now sort of twist the knife, deepen the objection um, about this sort of thing. Um, and this is gonna get us into some depressing reflections on recent events. Um, I, I myself am happy responding to the concerns of the previous slide just by appealing to the in, intrinsic value of knowledge, um, of knowledge with a capital K. I just, uh, to me, that seems intrinsically valuable to live in a world in which there are people who understand these things. We don't all need to understand it. It's enough for a few people to understand it. To me, that has intrinsic value. But, you know, notoriously, these sorts of, of intuitions are hard to defend, um, you know, and we find this in the classroom, too. If you try to persuade your students that this matters, they're just going to stare at you kind of incomprehendingly, I think. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to make that case. So I, I wouldn't want to rest a great deal on that thought. The familiar fallback position is to stress the instrumental goods of specialized knowledge, right? That these obscure discoveries are gonna lead us to cure diseases. They're gonna lead us to, you know, be able to get to Mars. It's not why we wanna to get to Mars, but, but there's gonna be various sorts of instrumental goods. Um, we can put up satellites in space that enhance communication across the globe and so on and so forth. But here we get into the depressing facts. As we've seen during the COVID pandemic, the climate change crisis, the Trump administration, and so on and so on, the stupidity of the many threatens to overwhelm the instrumental goods delivered by the few. You know, there are, there are these hardworking climate scientists out there who for decades now have been telling us what's going to come, trying to spread the news, failing to sufficiently spread the news. Um, it's not clear if what we're focused on are instrumental goods, it's not clear that the knowledge of the few is sufficient in the, in, in the world we seem to be living in. And so this might well make us wonder whether knowability, the knowledge of the elites, communal knowledge as I've defined it, is really so valuable. Uh, perhaps we should hope, so, so, th so that then leads to a couple of thoughts. Um, one thought, maybe that means I'm approaching this all wrong and, and what we should want to be living in is a world not just where there's communal knowledge with a capital K, the knowledge of a few elites, but where the knowledge can really be widespread. Um, another thought, perhaps we should hope to be living actually in an intellectually disaster wor disastrous world. Um, so perhaps rather than seeing our world slide slowly toward extinction, perhaps we'll discover some morning a message flashing in the sky, fin des jeux followed by a system reset it's at some much earlier restore point, right? We'll discover we have been living in a virtual reality and, and we've lost this game, but it's okay. It's just a game. We're gonna go back to some earlier stage of the game and we'll get to play again. Um, or perhaps there are invisible programmed constraints in our world that have already stopped us from blowing up the planet. Maybe this is the only thing keeping us alive and maybe it's actually evidence that we're living in a matrix that we've managed to survive as long as we have. Um, that if this really were a real world, unconstrained by you know, the, the programmer's constraints, um, we'd be dead already. Um, so maybe we should hope to be living in an intellectually disastrous world. I, I don't wanna go down that path. Um, I, I would, rather than embrace the possibility of these sorts of intellectual disasters as the thing that's going to save us, um, I'd prefer to take the risk of a world free from delusion. And that requires me in the end, kind of 
modifying the story I'd been telling and, and admitting that, that communal knowledge with a capital K is, is not the only thing that matters and that it actually is very important to take communal knowledge and to promote that so that the knowledge becomes more widespread. Um, so this is important if we're going to live in societies where the many are free to live as they choose um, and free to enact the political systems they prefer. Right, meditating on the nature of democracy in, in my country, most famously, but you know, in many of your countries too, true as well. Um, it's clear that um, the path forward is going to have to involve some sort of education, um, so that the knowledge of the few gets gets diffused out to the many. The goal has to be to reduce the gap between what is known, with a capital K, and what's commonly known. The gap can never be entirely closed. We're, we're past the days of the Renaissance man who will know everything that is known. Um, so there's no prospect of everything that's known with a capital K being widely diffused in our culture. But, but the gap has to be closed enough so that ordinary people are capable of acting in both their daily lives and in their political preferences in ways that our civilization's survival requires. And so this question of, of intellectual disasters and, and the flip side question of knowability and what we can know about the world around us, although there's a sense in which it makes good sense to start with the question of communal knowledge and thinking about the subject that way, ultimately you can't just leave it there if you're gonna take seriously into account the, the, the character of the world we live in and what's going to be required for our, for our survival in this world. Uh, and so ultimately, I think reflecting on this should lead us to think about the nature of education and how we can promote education in, in these sorts of spheres. And with that, I can bring things to a close. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, so the format will be the same as yesterday. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to jump in and let's see uh russ so uh thanks bob that was uh, a lot of fun um i had two sort of things that just kind of ran through my head and it got you got back to it at the end there about education i think and maybe here history is actually a help to you because ah. when you said when you said that you know in 1543 you know sort of the light came on and and we knew about the heliocentrism, 1623, Galileo comes up with atomism. It's not really right. I mean, mm. it took a hundred years more, mm. right? And even, you know, atomism really was until the 20th century, which you had mentioned that we really had an idea of how this is gonna work uh, in detail. So, um, I mean, science is a community too, you know, and you can kind of work with that a little bit to, to to show just how important the educational aspect, the the uh, upbringing aspect of science is as well. That, that I don't know. I'm trying to figure out a way to ask these as questions as opposed to these are just things that sort of occurred to me and you know maybe get your reaction to it. Yeah, that's in, that's interesting. I mean, so one, I think one one strand in in, in your remarks is that um, I don't want to. I, I, I shouldn't tell a story on which it's as if the, the communal knowledge with a capital K is just up to a few brilliant individuals as if they're acting in isolation and um, don't, you know, are not themselves part of a community and part of a part of a long history on, on which they're building. Um, so there's sort of, there, there's, there's groups within groups um, and um, the story, the story needs to be sensitive to that and sensitive to how long it can take these things to develop and the sort of the institutions that are required to develop them. Um, and I suppose maybe we could distinguish between different roles for education as well. There, I was thinking of, of kind of the popularizing education that takes discoveries and spreads it out to people who aren't themselves in, in the game of making discoveries. They're just, you know, ordinary citizens who need to be informed about these things. 
Um, but there's also the side of education that's more sort of the high level side of taking scientific discoveries, um, building on them, teaching them to the people who are going to make further scientific discoveries, developing institutions, you know, like the medieval university famously, you know, various modern institutions like the Royal Society in England that developed in the 17th century and other scientific societies around the same time, developing institutions of that sort that will foster a kind of a, a, a scientific community um, that will push forward at an elite level too. And that, yeah, that's, that all seems that all seems super important. Maybe, maybe the general lesson from all of that is that there's a whole lot more to be said. When I talk about communal knowledge, I, I kind of, I tried to be precise about one very limited aspect of what I meant, but there's so much more to say about what's involved in that, uh, that I don't have anything to say about. Charles. I have another one, but, but I mean, oh. let, let someone else. I, well, I think we have we have time. Um, again, okay. Well, I mean, the other thing that came to mind. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if you ever listened to Philosophy Bites, um, the the interviews mm. that uh, are, are done with, uh, and I heard uh, the one on implicit bias by Jennifer Saul. Uh huh. And the she was asked, well, um, why is this interesting? I mean, uh, you know. We have we have Descartes uh, and you know evil uh, uh, demon and all this and and she said but but this is real this is matrix in us it is uh -huh. nice. um, we ourselves are radically different than we think we are it's the ultimate type of delusion I I, I thought about it as you were you know talking and you know again it's just you know, I don't have a, like a, a well formulated question or comment but just um, that might be one a real intellectual uh, challenge for yeah. us along the lines you're painting. That's great. I, I actually, I, um, I, I know that paper very well that, that um, you're referring to by her. And in fact, I teach that, I, I've been teaching that in an intro class and the students really like it even at the intro level. Um, and I think if you just take one particular case like race of, of the kinds of cases she's interested in and you think about how, you know, we just so struggle and make a mess of, of issues in the domain of race. Um, Yes, there are wise people who understand these issues really well. Um, and that would satisfy my demand for communal knowledge with a capital K, but it's kind of woefully inadequate, you know? It's, that's a domain in which it's just not enough, you know, for a few wise people to understand what's going on with race. We desperately need to, you know, get that out there uh, to the masses. So I think that's a that's a great example of that phenomenon. It's and, and it's a great example precisely because it's a case where these kinds of you know skeptical scenarios or intellectual disasters are very real. It's it definitely it's a delusion that we suffer from. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Charles. Uh, hi, Bob. Thanks for that. Hey, uh, so so my question, I guess I could piggyback off that last example that Russell gave that Russ gave. Um, so to go back to the implicit bias case, there's some evidence that there, this is going on and a certain group of experts think this is real. And then there's another group of experts who think this really isn't going on, that the research is bad for this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So just in general, you could have these different groups who have kind of knowledge claims. And so what I'm wondering about is with your system, how, how would you have a way to adjudicate among those, those kind of pockets? Of the yeah, system? that's it. I mean, I suppose that's kind of, yeah, I mean, lots of examples of that kind you could think of. You might also think of my remarks about intensive delusion with respect to our own natures, whether we have immaterial souls, whether we're just, you know, brains and so on and so forth. Um, and those familiar disputes, you know, the experts haven't sorted that out yet. Um, and as, as long as we're still in a situation like that, um, it's still, I think it still counts for me as an intellectual disaster. Uh, I, I mean, I guess this would be another kind of gradation when I didn't particularly focus on a gradation between a case where we're so deluded, we don't even know what the question is. You know, it doesn't even occur to us to ask, 
Um, and, and maybe that was the situation with race and bias for a long time. We didn't even ask the questions. Now, when it comes to, to race, we're more in a situation where the questions are being asked and people dispute how well understood the answers are. Um, if we're just to get to the stage where the questions are being asked is a kind of progress, but it's by no means sufficient progress. Um, and um, it's still kind of a disastrous situation if we're stuck in the stage where we can ask the questions um, and we can't agree on the answer. Um, and I take it until some consensus develops about the answer, it's pretty tough to then go to the final stage of disseminating the information more widely. You know, obviously people try to do that all the time. You know, the churchlands go around and preach their reductive materialism about the mind. But, you know, there's people pushing back against them. And that makes their, you know, their efforts at spreading the gospel of, of, of the churchlands makes it more fraught. And, and, you know, the same with the people working in implicit bias. There's people pushing back against them. And that makes the prospects of education uh, tough. Okay, thank you. Philip. Thanks for the talk. And I was thinking about what makes the thing that you mentioned extensive delusion stable and why we are numb with this extensive delusion. And one cause that I had in mind is sort of bad form of relativism, whether it is individual or communal. I'm right, you are right, but we have contradictory views, something like that. And this is what I realized when I taught introduction to ethics at Colorado. And so I was thinking about whether this taking this bad form of relativism away can be a part of your solution mentioned at the end of the talk, namely the narrowing the gap between what is commonly known and what is capital K known. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Yeah. Yeah, I think, right, I guess it, it depends on the kinds of cases you're thinking about. Um, a lot of my examples were cases where I wasn't thinking about relativism because I was thinking uh, that, that, that those sorts of worries wouldn't be so applicable in those sorts of domains. You know, think, I mean, think of my examples like um, discovering continents um, in the 16th century. Um, um, you know, um, where it's hard to be a relativist about that sort of thing. Um, in astronomy, uh, you know, I don't know how widespread an impulse toward relativism is. So in those cases, I don't see relativism as being part of the puzzle. But I, I take your point that there's going to be other kinds of cases where, where relativism is very much part of the puzzle. Um, and, and obviously, you know, notoriously, the more we get into questions of value, the more those sorts of relative, relativistic sorts of um, problems are going to start to arise. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I didn't really at all focus on those sorts of cases, but you might, you know, you might give as an example our difficulty at grasping moral truths. And you might say we're, our, our world is somewhat intellectually disastrous in that way, too, in that there's so much dispute about, about ethical principles, to say nothing of political principles. Um, and um, maybe I didn't give those, maybe I didn't focus on those sorts of examples precisely because when you start to talk about those sorts of examples, relativism looms. And somebody might say, oh, well, what do you mean, like, grasping the true political truths? what makes us think there are, you know, facts of the matter about the correct political system. And so, yeah, when you get into those kinds of cases, the worry about relativism, I think, does loom, loom quite large. And that's, it's a kind of a, a hurdle to making any sort of progress as far as that sort of thing goes. Um, I have a similar, somewhat similar question um, to Philip. Um, so what if you are not a relativist, but you are, you are just a pessimist and you look at the history of science and you see that, you know, there are all these scientific theories and 
pretty much all of them have gotten falsified at some point or at least modified at some point. Um, and so instead of concluding this sort of progressive uh, optimistic story, you conclude that well, whatever scientific theory we come up with, um, it is bound to fail at some point. And so maybe there is just no, I mean, there, there, there is some um, sort of uh, principled um, hindrance to our grasping reality. Um, so what would, you, yeah. what would you say to such a pessimist? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right, that's, it's a, it's a question that in a way I think is quite relevant to this whole workshop um, because it, um, the, the very issue of knowability, I think, presupposes some sort of fixed goal uh, that we might aspire to. And, and what you're describing is a kind of a, a pessimistic sort of, um, you know, that progress is impossible, um, calls into question, I think, the whole, the, the whole theme of the workshop. Um, I remember when I was in graduate school, um, Richard Boyd was one of my teachers who's a, who was a big proponent of scientific realism uh, at Cornell. Um, and he really, in fact, liked this example of maps and discovery because he thought, here's, here's the case you want to show. So, someone who's a kind of an anti-scientific realist and thinks that science doesn't make progress and that even in science, there's this kind of relativism to be had. Boyd used to say, you know, show these people a series of maps you know, start back in antiquity and just show them the progression in the maps we've made of the globe. Um, is it really plausible to think there's no progress there? Isn't it, isn't, I mean, isn't it just self-evident that you can see from century to century and generation to generation, you can see progress in the direction of truth um, with each successive generation of maps displaying this trend toward a more accurate, a more truthful, a uh, more veridical map of the world. Um, and so that's a kind of a nice paradigm for what the realist, what the anti-relativist wants to be able to say about these sorts of cases. But, but obviously it's, it's a vast question. Thank you very much. Um, so let's thank Bob uh, once again for the very stimulating talk. Yeah.